Depending on where you are in the world and your access to raw materials or uh, synthetic amino acid availability, or even just um, the uh, quality of housing, um, all of these things are going to influence uh, how you're able to achieve the full genetic potential. As we all know, today's broilers have an enormous potential to convert feed into meat efficiently. But are we getting the maximum out of our birds? That's the question. This is the main talking point of this episode of Future Feed Talks. I am Fabian Brockter, the Editor-in-Chief of Poultry World, and this series is in cooperation with DSM Fermenich Animal Nutrition and Health. Today, I'm sitting down with Adam Sacrani, Senior Nutritionist at Poultry Genetics Company Avigen. Great to have you here, Adam. Just to get started, Adam, uh, can you give us some insights into the genetic progress Avigen made over the last few years? Because I think we came a long way from the broilers in the 60s. Yes, thank you, uh, Fabian, for this uh, uh, opportunity to talk to you. Um, yeah, indeed, uh, we've seen a great deal of progress over the last decades. Um, and um, on average, we um, have seen a two to three point improvement in feed conversion to a market weight. And uh, indeed, uh, we hope that this uh, will continue into the future. So uh, welfare traits um, have also improved greatly, in particular, um, leg health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are many, many parameters in, yes. uh, in genetic selection, uh, of course. Uh, but, but are we getting the most out of our uh, genetic progress uh, on farm? Or are there limiting factors, such as maybe amino acids? Yes, yeah, a good question. I mean, we, our ambition as a primary breeding company is to um, deliver uh, a conventional broiler product um, that is going to um, perform in a wide range of uh, environments mm -hmm. and uh, global conditions. Um, and of course, uh, depending on where you are in the world and your access to raw materials or uh, synthetic amino acid availability or even just um, the uh, quality of housing, um, all of these things are going to influence uh, how you're able to achieve the full genetic potential. But uh, I work across Europe and, I'm, um, and I see customers in Southern Europe and in North, Northern Western Europe that are achieving, uh, in some cases, they're outperforming our performance objectives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they really got their uh, situation sorted. Uh. Exactly. And, 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 and moving forward from that, um, uh, of course, there's always more potential. Uh, and uh, how would we get the most out of feed efficiency and improve in, in feed conversion ratios? Well, what we uh, understand about the modern broiler um, is that it is very, very responsive to balanced protein. And uh, balanced protein uh, can be understood as the level of lysine and the ratio of the other uh, amino, essential amino acids to it. And what we see is if you invest in higher levels of balanced protein over the growth cycle of the broiler, you see real improvements in daily gain, feed efficiency, and uh, carcass yield. Um, and of course, energy is a very important, important component of your performance as well. Mm -hmm. And um, ensuring that you have the right balance between energy and balanced protein is key mm -hmm. to achieving a company's specific feed conversion or daily gain mm -hmm. objectives. Because I can imagine when I see the day-to-day -day, uh, feed design, there's a lot of focus on metabolical, uh, uh, metabolizable energy. Yeah. Um, 
should we have more focus on, on, on balanced, balanced protein levels as a, as, as a general industry trend? Yes, I think uh, if we look at Aviagen's advice for the Ross 308 broiler mm -hmm. in 2019 and then the advice that we released uh, last year in 2022, you'll see that we've reduced energy and we've increased the amino acid density or the balanced protein uh, level in the feed. Um, so in many ways, that's the genetic company telling uh, the customer base that uh, it is the balanced protein that's driving production. Mm -hmm. But we can't forget about energy entirely. No, no, no that makes, <laughs> uh, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and, and how can we promote the best nutrient uptake and at the same time keep an eye on uh, cost of feed? Um, well, I think uh, there's a lot of hard work that goes into that. Mm. Um, it's about selecting um, the best possible raw materials that are available in your region, understanding um, the limitations to certain raw materials um, at certain ages. I mean, very high fiber, uh, uh, protein sources are not going to be um, the best choice in the first 10 days, but then there are options to use them um, thereafter. Um, and it's also about understanding um, the actual quality of those raw materials themselves. Um, they should be free of contamination. Um, they should um, be uh, as low as possible in mycotoxins, for example. And then it's uh, about um, careful formulation and feed production. Mm -hmm. um, because ideally what we want is the formulated feed uh, to match the feed that the feed mill is preparing and the, bird, uh, the feed that the bird is actually going to eat in the, uh, on the farm. And that's where the physical quality of the feed is very mm -hmm. important too. So all of these things contribute to um, uh, giving the bird the best possible chance of utilizing the nutrients in the feed to deposit muscle on its body. Mm -hmm. An efficient bird, of course, has a low feed consumption related to the output. Uh, how does that, in, a, in, the, in the view of a breeding company, uh, relate to sustainability? Uh, well, it's, I would say it's key. Um, I mean, there are many ways of understanding sustainability, and we have to keep an open mind around that. But if we consider uh, land usage and the amount of arable land that we are using to produce animal protein for the global population, then feed efficiency is incredibly important. And what we see with uh, conventional genotypes is that they are much more efficient at converting um, uh, feed to uh, muscle mm -hmm. that then becomes um, our uh, nutritious source of animal protein. And of course, there, in some regions in the world, there is a trend to move towards slower growing uh, birds. And in, in my opinion, they tend to be a little less efficient when it comes to feed uh, to, to meat conversion. Um, what's the perspective of, of, of aviation in, in, the, in that trend? Well, our perspective is that we've actually been selecting, um, um, well, slower growing genotypes have been part of our selection program for over 20 years. And really our objective is to have a diverse portfolio of, of uh, genotypes that are going to meet um, the consumer's um, demand. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and these slower growing genotypes, um, yes, you're right, they're slightly less efficient, mm -hmm. um, but we still select them um, in, in a balanced fashion mm -hmm. um, for good productivity on a breeder level, for, for good efficiency and welfare trades. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, our objective is to just meet the, uh, um, the demands of the consumer and provide options for uh, poultry producers. Mm -hmm. And you would see uh, a similar improvement in the slow, uh, uh, slower growing bro broiler portfolio than in the conventional broiler portfolio. 
Yes, certainly um, our um, objectives on a breeder level uh, are very uh, closely aligned. Mm. And we also um, want um, to deliver as an efficient, uh, slow growing genotype as possible. But you have to also balance that with um, the slower growing nature of these animals. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. It would be too easy to go to a fast grow. Exactly. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, yes, yes. All right. uh, do you see like uh, uh, different breed genotypes to suit extreme climate conditions? Uh, and, and can you uh, tell more about the involvement of aviagen during? Well, again, uh, the conventional um, Ross 308 broiler uh, has been selected to, to be able to withstand um, uh, a great varying degree of environmental um, pressures and conditions. Um, so this continues to be our objective, but within our portfolio, we have different um, lines that um, might be better suited um, to certain conditions. But in general, um, uh, it is the conventional broiler that is really designed to work, uh, to perform under many different conditions. Yeah, and I actually have to say, to say I have, have seen them perform yeah. from all the way from colder climates in Finland to, to, to really hot and humid climates in, in Brazil. So exactly. Pre prefer, uh, yeah. Performs everywhere. And, you know, also nutrition and management plays a part in making sure that this um, bird performs. Um, for example, um, in hotter conditions, uh, an animal might reduce its feed intake. Mm -hmm. And there it might be even more important to increase the density of the feed. <laughs> and, and circling back and tying into that, uh, to getting the most out of our bird gen genetics, what would be your main advice to both nutritionists and, and broad growers? Well, I think um, physical feed quality uh, is incredibly important, especially uh, to achieve the first uh, 10 days mm. performance. And of course, we know how important that early performance is in achieving our final objective. We also can see that uh, perhaps 80% of the first week performance is down to the quality, the physical quality of the feed and um, management. Um, and by management, I mean ensuring that uh, the environment in the house is um, conducive to uh, uh, feed intake and growth. Mm -hmm. um, so, and beyond that, I think that our uh, advice, uh, our global nutrition specifications are an excellent starting point um, for most places in the world achieving the performance objectives of this animal. All right. well, thank you very much for your insights in getting the most out of our broader genetic animal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pippin. If you want to see more episodes of Future Feed Talks or listen to our podcasts, please click on the link below.